He eyes the cauldron around the base of the lighthouse with caution, deciding the best approach, if he'll put the boat ahead or astern, if he'll anchor her down or let her stay loose. Freezing water splurges across a sunken warren of rocks. When the sea fills up, the rocks disappear. When it drops, they emerge like black, glistening molars. Of all the towers, it's the bishop, the wolf and the maiden that are hardest to land, and if he had to pick, he'd say the maiden took it. Sailor's legend had it she was built on the jaws of a fossilised sea monster. Dozens died in her construction, and the reef has killed many an off-course mariner. She doesn't like outsiders. She doesn't welcome people. Welcome to the Waterstones podcast. I'm Will Rycroft, and in this episode of This is the Book, we look at a novel which taps into our fascination with the sea, the lighthouses that mark our coastline, and a pitch-perfect mystery that is enough to snag any reader. A lighthouse found deserted, its three keepers missing, the door locked from the inside, the clocks stopped, and a table set for a dinner that was never eaten. And what makes it even more intriguing is that it's based on a real unsolved mystery. To begin with, I asked author Emma Stonex when her fascination with this story first surfaced. Oh, this is going a long way back. Um, I think there's two answers to your question. The first is the real life story of the disappearance of these lighthouse keepers, which I discovered about 10 years ago. And it's the disappearance of three keepers from the Flannan Isles Lighthouse in 1900. And I came across this story in a magazine called the Fortean Times, which is a sort of, it's a fortnightly magazine about weird and wonderful stuff from across the globe. Um, and as soon as I read it, I just thought, gosh, that would make the most magical novel. Um, so that was, that was one element about 10 years ago. But I think before that, it's just been the call of the sea, really. I've always had a yearning for the sea. Um, my grandma used to live on the Isle of Wight in a house overlooking the Solent, and we used to go and visit her there. And I think just all that sea gazing I did as a child, particularly the British coastline, the sort of grey yellowy grey colour, that very specific colour of the sea in certain parts of Britain, just really called to me with a sort of sadness, is the best way I can describe it. And so when I came across the story, the real story of, of um, these vanished lighthouse keepers, the two things sort of slotted together. And I just thought, this is it, this is the one. Um, and I mean, as I say, that was a long time ago, but as you so nicely put it, that light has sort of been shimmering in my peripheral imagination all this time and, and I knew that therefore this was the one. And when you say the one, you mean the one to be written under your own name because this book feels like the launch of a debut voice but you have in fact been honing your craft for the last 10 years or so, haven't you? Yeah, absolutely. So when I first signed with my literary agent, I mean, this is going back, oh goodness, 12 years or something? Um, and I signed with her for a different book. Um, so over the past 10 years, I've written books under three different pseudonyms, commercial women's fiction. Um, but back when I first met her, I told her that I wanted to write a book about a lighthouse. Um, and I wanted to keep my real name for it. Um, and she sort of remembered that through the years. And I obviously did because I was reading as much as I could about lighthouses. Um, and yeah, I, I just, I, I felt like my name was something that I, I wanted to save for a passion project and for this project specific, specifically um, it's the one that never went away and I think that's that's a good test for an author actually when you have an idea that can you live with it for not only months but years and it just won't leave you alone so I just knew early on that this was the book that I wanted to put my name to. And that literary agent was Madeline Milburn who remembers the conversation when they first met. And as we hear from them both now, you get a sense of why this story was so captivating and the process by which it was written. Yeah, she, she mentioned it when I first met her. She said, um, I've, I've got, an, I've got a, another idea, a literary novel in me, but I'm not ready to write it yet. I need to hone my craft. I need to work, you know, I need to write this, this women's fiction under a different name. Um, but she, she did talk about this idea very very early on and I knew she always had it in her um, and then it was years later that she said to me I think I'm ready to do it and we are at this kind of 
crossroads of whether to continue with the commercial woman's fiction or, you know, I wanted to give her the free reign to go and write this thing that she was so passionate about. When I go to the coast and when I visited lighthouses, there is just something about them. And I think there's something about lighthouses generally. Um, when you speak to people, you get a reaction. So everybody has a feeling about lighthouses and it's strange. I don't know whether it's nostalgia for childhood holidays or whether it's just something we can't quite put our fingers on. Um, they just carry this kind of haunting longing. Um, and coupled with the sea, which is just such a powerful tool in a writer's fiction, um, it just was the perfect marriage. But I think for me, yeah, to answer your question, I think the sea is, I mean, the sea is the ultimate mystery. I read recently that we know more about outer space than we do some regions of the sea. The sea is just the ultimate mystery for me. And so combined with this real life vanishing was the perfect mix. I was spellbound by the pitch. I, I just remember her saying that oh, she'd been inspired by the story of these three missing lighthouse keepers of the Flannan Isles in 1900 and how the door remained closed to the lighthouse. The clock had stopped. There was no sign of a storm. Yet these men had just disappeared and were never found again. And she wanted to explore this unsolved mystery through a literary reimagining. Um, and it was so haunting and ghostly, this, this pitch that she was giving me. And I just thought, my, this, is, this is it. You've got to write this. And then she said, it's not just about the lighthouse keepers. It's about the wives that they left behind. And I thought, oh, my gosh, that's it. That's another layer to this exciting. <laughs> um, and I knew and this pitch. And I knew that I had this winning concept. Um, and then she 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 went away and wrote that um, and, and delivered me a first draft in, I think it was January 2019. And then I got a real sense of her writing. And I thought, oh, my gosh, this is a whole <laughs> it, it was I mean, she was so good at the commercial women's fiction, but this literary kind of writing was just a whole other level. It felt pretty fully formed because I had read so much about lighthouses over the course of, of several years, particularly lighthouse keepers and their families. And that was what really interested me about this story was the psychology of the people involved. So I read various um, technical manuals about lighthouses. Um, which I needed to kind of get get the the grounding, the knowledge. But it was more the interest in what made a person want to do that job. If indeed he did want to do that job, there were many keepers who didn't like the life, but many who did. And particularly when it comes to the sea towers, so the one, the lighthouses out in the middle of the sea, that are often miles away from land. What was it about that? situation that appealed to these men. So I've set uh, the Lamplighters in the 1970s, which was a really interesting period in the UK for lighthouse keeping because the service was attracting um, men from many different backgrounds. So historically, it, generally, it had been men from a nautical tradition. Um, but in the 70s, you, you might have people who'd been in prison, um, young men who'd been in Borstal, um, students, ex-lorry drivers, a huge range of, of men who were attracted to join. And it was why that was that really caught my imagination. So when I sat down to write, I felt like I was already in the mindset of these men. Um, and they were the ones who told the story. And the story is told from multiple first person perspectives. And there's a very conscious reason for that, because it is the psychology that interests me the most. And I knew that once I had that had clicked in my mind, that I could let these people tell their story. The mystery itself, I needed to be really careful with because it seems an obvious thing to say, but a mystery is is only got its fire as, as long as it's unsolved. And the real life mystery of the Fan and Isles Lighthouse has never been solved. And I knew that I wanted to offer an answer to readers. I think without an answer, it would feel unsatisfying. But at the same time, I wanted to be really careful to leave enough room for readers to bring their own thoughts and ideas to the ending and um, to let the, the mystery breathe on past the final page. Um, so I did want to have that tension of we're going to discover the answer, but at the same time for readers to think maybe there are some other strands in there that could play out in a different direction, and this is what I think. Um, 
but in terms of arranging the pieces towards that answer, it, it came pretty naturally. The 1970s strand follows the action on the tower. So we witness the building tensions between the men, threats of conflict. Um, and then we have the women looking back and we piece together their lives and, and each story sort of feeds into the other. I mean, the only way I can answer it honestly is to say drafting and drafting and drafting <laughs> <laughs> about 18 or 20 drafts to get the pieces matching up in the right way. But I knew before I began what my answer was, what I thought happened. And that was a really good steer through the writing process. And then I, I started reading those pages and I was just transfixed from the very first one. And it was the atmosphere that she created. It's this evocative imagery of the sea, it totally drew me in. And the idea of the lamplighters and what they're able to withstand being locked away from their families for these long stretches of time was absolutely fascinating. And then the type of madness that could bring about. And so I knew that publishers were going to want this and it was my job to, you know the, I, I felt real pressure at this stage to find the right match yeah and I you knew this project was so personal to Emma you know she it was this lifelong passion that she has for lighthouses and um and you know all the research she's done over the years um and the writers that she's been influenced by so so it was my job to kind of be this literary matchmaker and find her you know the right home to say there was fevered interest from several publishers would be an understatement and after a multi-way auction, both here and abroad, it was Picador that became home to the Lamplighters. To understand some of that in-house excitement, we'll hear in a moment from Head of Marketing, Katie Bowden. But before that, Editorial Director Sophie Jonathan remembers her first encounters with the book. Well, the Lamplighters actually came into my life when I was on maternity leave. My wonderful colleague, Francesca Main, um, acquired the book. Um, and in my sporadic... Uh, points of contact with all of my colleagues, it was the only thing anyone ever spoke about. So when I returned to work and Francesca um, had left the company, I was lucky enough to take um, Emma on. And so, yeah, so I was in a rare position as an editor um, of reading this book when it was, it was almost finished. Most of the edits had been done. It was completely extraordinary. One of the things uh, we look for as publishers is that sort of those books that have it all. Um, Picador is a literary publisher, you know, it's the voice above all that is important to us. And this book has voice in spades. You can you can taste the salt in the air. Uh, you can you can feel the sea spray on your face. And yet the concept, it's so perfectly set up. This idea of a, a lighthouse abandoned the clocks have stopped, the door is locked from the inside. A mystery like that is completely impossible to resist. And so uh, when I came to the book um, as a, a sort of more traditional reader, I suppose, than as an editor, it was that that immediately captivated me. But the book moves from that mystery into this extraordinary exploration of grief, of loss, of love and jealousy. And then what becomes a really intoxicating exploration of the way our fears and desires form their own reality, the way we might confuse the real and the maybe imagined. It's completely overwhelming, actually. You know you've got a good book when meetings become fevered book club discussions. Those are the, the books come in and you know they're the right ones when uh, you realise that this is why everyone does the job that they do. This is why we're all here. We're here for the books. And they're the rare books that really unite every sort of reader, the readers who are after that mystery, who are after that love story, who are after total escapism, you know. And like I said, it's that you recognise Cornwall, you have a sense of the time and the place. This is a book set um, in the 90s and then with the main story back in 1972. And you you feel the country as it was then, you know, with, with the women taking on the, the brunt of the domestic labour with their menfolk just out of sight of the coast it's so palpable it's electrifying and yes I think I found myself talking and talking and talking to colleagues about this book in meetings that were about something else entirely and there is a sort of feverishness that really is the reason I do my job that sort of shared sense of love it was one of those books that everyone in Picador had read 
And as soon as we knew that we'd got it, it was just immediately start thinking about how can we get this to readers. One of the things that was most exciting for me about this book was how broad the potential readership is. I think there are um, shades of Daphne du Maurier and Sarah Waters in this novel, but there's also shades of Kate Morton and Eve Chase and Raina Wynn. There's such a broad potential audience. Now, one of the author names we heard there was Raina Wynn, whose best-selling memoir, The Salt Path, chronicled her journey along the 630-mile-long southwest coast path as she dealt with grief and encountered the healing power of the natural world. As someone so familiar with the setting for this novel, she was naturally one of the first people approached to read an early copy of it. I'd spent quite a lot of time um, on the headlands that overlook the lighthouse that, uh, that Emma talks about, and um, and her writing just put me there. It put me there with that view out to that lighthouse and that, that sense of, of it being something slightly otherworldly. Part of part of us, part of the land, but but out there in the sea and so separate and disconnected at the same time. We think of Cornwall as being a holiday destination, but um but when you you're actually on the coast, it's something so much more than that. It's it's the very edge of the land, the very start of that wide Atlantic endless sea. And and there's something incredibly rugged, incredibly close to nature there, close to close to the weather systems and and the elements. Um and, and you've got those constant colours of Cornwall there, the green of the of the headlands and the, the black of the rocks with that constant breaking white foam at the base. And I think uh, I think the lamplighters captures that quite rural, quite domestic, but also at the same time really, really wild and rugged sense of what that coastline is. I think for the characters who are left behind, um, the ones that know that their their family members are out there at that lighthouse, or wherever they may be, um, there's a sense of it being it being something that's just out of reach. Of, of being something that is is so close, but yet yet utterly unreachable, and I think that's what makes this book so remarkable. Actually, it's because every page and every character, not just the characters who are on the lighthouse, but the ones left behind, they all really resonate with that that sort of dark, powerful presence of the sea, and it permeates all their lives whether they're, they're there on that piece of rock just surrounded by sea or whether they're left at home and thinking about what might be happening there. Another early reader was S.J. Watson, author of the international best-selling thriller Before I Go to Sleep, who of course knows a thing or two about what makes for a compelling read. I remember it didn't have a jacket of any description. It was just a blank jacket. So I went into the book with no preconceptions, although I was intrigued just by the title and the fact it was about lighthouses, because I think lighthouses have a um, a fascination for me and for many other people as well. So that's what kind of drew me to the book. But as soon as I started reading it, I mean, the premise is so brilliant. It was just such a beguiling, intriguing premise that... Um, that uh, I just found myself pulled into it and the quality of the writing as well was just so brilliant. So um, I don't remember the exact moment when I thought this is this is, this is is going to be a good read, but uh, it was very early on. Yeah, I read the book and I thought this is a combination of sort of a mystery, a locked room story, um, almost a crime novel, almost thriller, uh, at the same time as being a kind of ghost story uh, and a love story. So sort of combined the best elements of all of those things. Like the best thrillers, it just kind of compelled me to keep on going and find out what, what was happening. Uh, it was just such a good story, so brilliantly written. And of course, praise from other writers isn't just good for an author's ego, it's a gift for their publicist. As Georgina Moore, Director of Books and Publishing at Midas PR, explains. I think it's one of those books that keeps the pages turning, but also it's a book that has so much craft. And, and one of the reasons I think it's had so much early acclaim from other writers um, is because they admire the craft in it. And I, you often see that in publishing, that, that books that get early quotes from a lot of other authors are, are the ones that have been beautifully crafted. And that is the case with The Lamplighters. But it is also a satisfying page-turning mystery. In lockdown, everyone's very fed up. 
Um, people don't know, you know, what's happening, whether it's going to change. And the mood in the media, you, people, do they want COVID-related stories, don't they? This has been a book that's cut through all that, um, probably because they can sense, the media can sense the, the enthusiasm behind it and a kind of building force of that. But also whenever anyone reads it, I get these amazing emails. Um, so all the magazine people who've read it for review have just sent me emails saying, I, I love The Lamplighters. It's one of my favourite books this year, which is fantastic. But I think the key of it is Emma herself. And this is clearly a story that's haunted her for a long time. And that makes a brilliant in. For, for a publicist with the media and the fact that it's been something that's been on her mind for 10 years and this kind of feeling that she really loves the sea and the lighthouses and the research she did she did amazing research she went and stayed in a lighthouse keeper's cottage and so really embrace that sense of isolation and, and you can feel that now you may remember that sj watson mentioned the plain wrapped proof copy that arrived through his letterbox allowing him to read without preconceptions but naturally a huge amount of work has gone into the stunning design for the hardback edition and some extra special work for the Waterstones exclusive edition. Here to tell us more is design manager at Picador, Katie Took. It was a pretty free brief. The theme of the sea, the ta- obviously the lighthouse was going to be key, so I had sort of key words given to me in the brief, the sort of slight menace of the sea as well as the beauty. Um, so I was given more of a sort of tone, and I sort of got stuck into the, to the reading and trying to really come up with trying to sort of be more original in the design rather than, yeah, very prescriptive brief, which some book covers obviously can be. So when I was researching, I was, you know, it took me quite a while to get to the marbling. I think I was really aware that I wanted to represent the sea, um, but obviously from looking at loads of photos and, you know, lots of illustration of the sea, I felt like there'd been quite a few book covers that had already represented the sea in a certain way, in a certain illustrative style. And I think if I just happened by accident to be looking at some images to do with marbling and I wanted to try and represent the sea on this cover that also gave us another sense of what was going on in the book and the fact that when he looked out, when the main character looked out to sea, he didn't, he would see things and he would, his brain would sort of go a bit wild and he'd start to imagine things out there. And I suppose when I saw the marbling, I thought, oh, that, that reminds me of the sea but also it has that swirling element where you sometimes think that you might have just seen another shape or it or it sort of slightly catches you off guard. And I love the idea that the marbling pattern was sort of being made into the sea. So it was a sort of, um, yeah, I, I like the fact that it was something that we all know, but it was then creating this seascape. And I think the colourways, again, I was sort of keen to see if our idea of the sea could be pushed from in a color way as well you know we we obviously know what the sea looks like and its colors but um, I wanted more of a drama to to come into it and um, I sort of knew that I wanted a quite simple color palette so the red the blue and the black seem to just work really nicely and it's sort of a designer's dream to kind of be told that you can have a sprayed edge um so just to add because you know we're always we're always designing to us to a almost a set set format the whole time and um so when you get a little bit of freedom to kind of go over to the edge that's a really pleasing thing and um I was lucky enough to commission so I sort of came up with the concept and then I commissioned someone called Max Ellis who works at CIA illustration agency and he was the genius in almost creating I think he actually got you know marbling inks out and kind of started from scratch with marbling and then put it digitally onto the computer um, so he was brilliant at kind of making the marbling an actual working document. And then I said to him, you know, I asked him, do you have any plain colour marbling for the end papers that we can sort of, so the whole thing tied up together. And then um, I took a section of his artwork to create the um, sprayed edge, which I think looks lovely, actually, just just the fact that you can just sort of turn the whole book round and it feels like it's a complete package is great. I think just being a creative, it's hard to sometimes see the light when you're in it. But I think when finally you get the book through the door, it is a lovely thing to see, actually. And it does sort of remind you what your job is in the fact that you're trying to create these beautiful books. Sometimes we can get a little bit caught up in the process of it all. but um, And obviously we're working a year in advance of a lot of our publications. So sometimes they're quite a sort of long, it's been a long process. So finally, when you get the book through, 
and you've had that little bit of space from it it's it's a it is a really rewarding feeling and I think I mean the best feeling is when you see someone reading your cover say on a train or um, a bus or something and you you've also had that sort of time apart from it and you can see it in a sort of fresh light it's a it's a nice feeling to know that that's you know that you've you've contributed to that process and as you might imagine that same joy is multiplied even more when the author themselves finally gets to see the finished copy especially of a book which has been gestating for a decade by pure chance on the day we recorded a very special envelope had arrived at emma's door oh i mean i it, it's it's difficult to describe i i <laughs> I got up about an hour ago, not out of bed. That makes it sound like I got out of bed an hour ago. I didn't. I <laughs> got off my desk an hour ago. I <laughs> knock on the door and this envelope. And I knew before I opened it because my editor said yesterday that she'd received her copies. And my heart was just thumping in my chest. And I'd, obviously I've seen the cover and I've they, the publishers have kept me really um, linked up with everything that's going on with that. So I, I know, knew what it was going to look like, but there's nothing that can prepare you for holding this wonderful object in your hands. And it's the first hardback that I've ever held of, of mine. Um, and there's something just so solid and definite about that. And that's really nice at the end of a process. And any author will, I'm sure, identify on some level a process of such uncertainty and such self-doubt to finally have this wonderful weight in your hands that is proof of the work and the toil and the heartache and the love that's gone into it. It's a stunning package and the Waterstones edges are just to die for. So I am completely in love with it. I hope that readers will take away a new love of and fascination for lighthouses. Um, I know that through my reading about them, I have fallen in love with them. The manned lighthouse is extinct now, so all lighthouses in the UK are automated which just adds to their haunting beauty. I think you look out the lighthouse in the middle of the sea and you know that there's nobody on it. And it's this incredible feat of engineering. Um, and yet it's empty. Um, or is it? Uh, <laughs> so I hope that I inspire an interest in lighthouses um, for people. And I also just hope that this is a book to get lost in, that people can open it and find themselves at sea um, at a time when a lot of us can't get to the sea, um, that they are intoxicated by the mystery and that it inspires their imagination. The Lamplighters by Emma Stonex is out now and the Waterstones exclusive edition really is something special. Huge thanks to everyone who contributed to this episode. We will be returning through the doors of the same publisher very soon in our other series, How We Made, to hear all about the publication of a cult classic. Don't panic, but fans of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy are in for a real treat as we speak to an incredible cast of characters about Douglas Adams' comic masterpiece. Here on This Is The Book, we will soon be discovering exactly what has been going on in The Last House on Needless Street, a dark, psychological thriller from Katrina Ward. See you soon. <laughs>